the CMO forum is something that we kicked off last year. Um, the intent was to provide some value to those of you in the industry that are not uh, in R&D. Most of what we do at SID uh, at Display Week is R&D related. So we wanted to have, that's why we have the business track, uh, which is uh, this year done jointly with DSCC, and uh, that's why we have the CMO forum uh, to provide you some value uh, for those of you that are in the sales, marketing, supply chain, uh, and, uh, and other disciplines that is uh, outside of the technology area. Uh, with that, uh, let me introduce our panel. And uh, as I introduce, I would request the panel to uh, come up to the podium and take your seat. Uh, first, uh, Justin Kowitz is Senior Vice President at Kent Displays. Welcome, Justin. I don't intend to today go through their entire bio. Uh, you have it in the program. You can read it. But in their introduction, they will uh, tell you a little bit about themselves. Uh, Dr. Mark Verall is Senior Vice President at Merck. Welcome, Mark. <laughs> Bahar Wadia is President of Vision Ox USA. Welcome, Bahar. Uh, you know, we, we can't have two Shri's, but uh, we do. Uh, Shri Subramanian is Senior Vice President of Technology uh, for uh, Technicolor. So our intent uh, with this panel is to talk uh, uh, about this theme that Tara came about. Uh, where Tara uh, 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 decided to uh, um, uh, comprise this idea of content meets display, right? Because we are here in LA, um, in uh, the heart of the film industry, and uh, uh, film people use displays, and uh, uh, we enjoy a lot of aspects of the display is enjoyed through some of its content. So that was the intent, that is the theme, and we're gonna maintain that particular theme. So I'm gonna uh, ask each of the uh, panel members to briefly introduce themselves and tell us uh, uh, what brought them uh, to this particular uh, industry and uh, why they're doing what they're doing. We'll start with you, Justin. Great, thanks. Start with the new guy. <laughs> so, uh, I'm relatively new to the industry. I've only been in the, uh, uh, in the category for about two years. And uh, prior to that, I spent about 25 years in sales, marketing, product development with more of the Fortune companies, uh, Sherwin-Williams, Newell Rubbermaid, Bemis Corporation. Uh, and I, I probably, I thought a lot about this question is what brought me to this industry and what attracted me is, and it's total luck. Um, I was uh, big companies. I was always sort of the big traditional brand marketing, product development, traditional cycles. And uh, I had some opportunities where a uh, company got sold off and wanted to do something a little different. Had been on the commercial side of things with Bemis Corporation, the consumer side with uh, Sherwin Williams and Rubbermaid. And I wanted to do something a little different. So I was looking for a different type of company and quite honestly, I got lucky. Um, uh, I saw this opportunity with the amazing people and amazing technology that wasn't out there. And I thought, could I possibly be part of this? Uh, being able to establish a new platform, being able to bring new technologies to people. Uh, and to this day, I still feel so lucky to be part of it. I'm still learning, I'm still growing, and getting to understand it all, but it's, uh, it, it's, it's total luck. Uh, just a uh, pleasure and blessed to be part of it. Wonderful. How about you, Mark? Okay, I'm, I'm not quite so new in the industry. I had more than 25 years working in the technology and research and development of liquid crystals and other display-related materials. So. I'm sitting up here as an R&D guy, and you just said that this is not R&D. <laughs> just, just because I'm a technology person doesn't mean that I'm not also very passionate about the content, about the usage, about the applications. And uh, it's actually that that drove me into, the, into this business and kept me here. So 25 years has seen fantastic changes in the display industry. And uh, you know, I expect another 25 years of fantastic changes in the display industry as well. So. If I can survive that long, I'll, I'll be there. <laughs> I'm sure you will. Mahar? <laughs> so, like Mark, I've uh, spent uh, pretty much my entire life in the uh, HMI uh, business, uh, specifically because I find HMI is very fascinating. Uh, they track human progress. They're a great proxy for human progress. And uh, 
uh, as of recent, uh, displays have become an indispensable part of ourselves. I mean, they are how we pretty much connect to the rest of the world. And so that's what brought me uh, to this uh, space, uh, specifically with Vision Art uh, uh, as an as a, as a OLED, uh, uh, OLED company. So. Yeah, well, first of all, good morning to you, to all of you. Um, you know, I, I'm a product device guy, so slightly different. Uh, I've spent uh, most of my career with uh, semiconductor companies and smart devices, and you know, I've seen the evolution of uh, displays uh, from personally, I, I had uh, the first, some of the first X86 computers, and it's just been really fascinating to me. Uh, display is what really brings out the life of, of a device, right? And, and that's, uh, uh, that, that's what attracted me to uh, Technicolor. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of focus on not just the device, but also the content side. That's, in fact, the theme of uh, this panel. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's exciting to see uh, the future evolve with uh, more and more, uh, uh, you know, innovations in display, combine that with AI. It's very exciting. Thank you. Um, probably this is true for some of you, uh, and it's definitely true for me, other than the fact that uh, we had a change in moderator this morning, we also had another crisis that I was dealing with. I was up until uh, maybe 2 o'clock in the morning, and then uh, I'm not a morning person. So here's something that I do. Um, and uh, those of you, just like John Lomanchuk, who's in the audience that was here uh, last year uh, at our forum, um, I believe that we absorb information better and we got a little bit more blood flowing to us, more oxygen. Okay. This is what we're going to do. And uh, it's optional. Uh, I hope if you're holding a cup of coffee, you may want to put it down. Um, I would like everybody, those that are able, to please stand up, including my panel, please. Um, and if you're in the middle of the aisle, you may want to, uh, or middle of the, uh, yeah, you just get out into the open because what I'd like to do, put your hands up in the air this way. Let me see, I'm not covering Justin. And uh, I'm gonna have every one of us jump up and down 30 times, okay? Yeah. Follow my cue. And you know, if, you, if your feet hurt, and if you're tired, and if you've got a medical condition, don't do it. Others, they're gonna go up and down. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. All right. <laughs> Good morning. That looks great from up here. <laughs> <laughs> no, Joel, we're not doing push-ups. Uh, I have found that for me, when I speak, whether I'm on the phone or in a, in a panel like this, uh, I'm supposed to be seated, but it's very hard. But when, I, when I talk, I always get up, I keep moving. And uh, this has helped me. I can, uh, and I'm a little bit out of breath, but my energy level is significantly higher than it was just a moment ago. But thank you for participating. Uh, our first question uh, to the panel is, how dependent is our display industry on content, and vice versa? Okay. Sri, would you like to take that? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, you know, I, I see uh, a strong dependency between the two, right? Uh, it's, it's almost a, a chicken and egg kind of situation where if you don't have good content, you can't really uh, bring it out on the device that might have a really good display. And, and vice versa. Um, you know, a good example of that is on the VR market today. You, you see a lot of big players uh, roll out uh, uh, VR HMD devices that, that are great, but uh, there's a little bit of a lack of content um, today. And, uh, you know, there's, there's a theme going on that only when the content comes in, you're going to see uh, a penetration of VR devices in the market. And, uh, at, at Technicolor, you know, we're working with some of the high-end content um, that's going to help the market for VR. Uh, but when you look at the UGC and the mass market devices and, and content, you know, we still have a way to go. So I see a couple of years for VR to take off because of, uh, because of the whole content meets display kind of thing. So 
So that's, you know, I, I feel there's really tight coupling between the two. Uh -huh. Mark, you are, uh, you know, in the industry, uh, and Sri represents the content side more than uh, the display industry per se. Uh, what are your thoughts? I mean, I have to agree there's a chicken and egg here. Um, if, if you look at the, the large size TVs you can find in the market now, you have fantastic resolution TV. But most of us don't have a signal or content that can really do justice to this technology. But in, in this case, you've got the, the technical side driving forward the capability to present a resolution that we don't yet have in the, in the case of most signals. And in other cases, you find that the, uh, that the content is really ahead of the technology, right. but, but they drive each other. I think without it, you don't get innovation, you don't get the move forward. So it's, yeah. it's absolutely critical that both sides of this game keep pushing forward, driving the other one forward. I think so too. Um, There's, um, uh, please go ahead. There's also the, 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 the user part of the, the, the equation that we sometimes miss. Uh, if you think about it, uh, we can, we can, the largest growing segment in, in content uh, is small content that we consume over, say, YouTube or uh, personal devices or, ta or tablets. And uh, uh, that segment is growing. And uh, the displays have gotten quite nice in the small format to enjoy the content. Uh, and it's easy to create content, and, and, and there is this, uh, this change that's also occurring that, uh, uh, that ties the two together, um, the usability with the advancements in smaller displays, and then the ability to consume content anywhere. Um, when we talk about content, one of the interesting things that's happening in the market is um, the whole aspect of AR, VR and um, to create some immersive content to, um, you know, so that these displays are better utilized and there's greater value. Uh, Bahar, what do you think is the future of uh, augmented reality? So AR VR is awesome. You come to any one of these shows and you'll enjoy a great demo. The problem is it's a great demo. It's not an indispensable uh, uh, tool. And until it becomes an indispensable tool, it cannot be uh, successful. So think about it. Uh, is the AR VR that you've seen here something that you would turn around your car, go back home because you left it? No. I mean, I have a few, few of these, and after the first couple of weeks of, oh, this is awesome, they just sit in the, in the drawer. Um, and, there's, uh, and I think a lot of folks, even yesterday, Clay talked about it, there's, it, there's a combination of hardware and uh, uh, software uh, and content that all have to come together. And purpose-driven uh, 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 applications, I believe, will start to drive uh, real use cases. Uh, one of the companies I'm involved with, uh, Quake Tech, uh, uh, we make uh, augmented reality for firefighters by leveraging uh, the early vision and late vision of how the brain processes uh, information. And this allows firefighters to go in and out of fires five times faster. This is meaningful. This becomes an indispensable tool. So it's a, granted, it's a very small use case uh, compared to the consumer market. But when you start thinking about it in terms of how am I going to solve this problem so it becomes an indispensable tool, then it becomes awesome. Otherwise, it's just awesome uh, trade show demos. Of course. And I think that's the same thing as we talk about all these great technologies is how do you make it in the fabric of consumers' lives or people's lives? And, you know, it's interesting because people want 70-inch televisions and they want to walk into the information and they want this amazing stuff, but the real-life applications come down to little things. And how do you make it more, uh, you know, when you get in your car, when you train somebody for a new job? And, and when it, I think when that technology meets the everyday little things for people's lives that become ingrained, that's what ends up exploding this to now it's mass market, now mm -hmm. it's ingrained in our lives, now it's your phone that you can't get rid of. And I think that's, that's that next step that we're moving towards, but until it becomes more than just a trade show demo and something very cool. Absolutely. Well, the, unlike maybe the semiconductor industry and folks who write software and so on and so forth, uh, when you buy a consumer device, sometimes if, you, if you, your product was semiconductor, it, it, it's hidden inside the device. You can't kind of point out to the particular product that you were personally involved in designing. Display is the face of pretty much all the products where it is used. So you can uh, you know, proudly talk about uh, 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 your product. Yet, when you package a device with the display, um, you no longer see the display, you see a package. 
Um, Justin is uh, uh, running marketing for Kent Displays where the product is packaged. Uh, and uh, uh, you've got a lot of background in uh, uh, trying to convince consumers to adopt a product not based on the product's functionality, but also the first time buyers look at the package. Tell us your experience uh, uh, in, in the consumer space. Well, it's a constant challenge because you first have to create the perception of what the product even does, and then you have to ingrain it with them of, how, here's how I can use that in my life, or here's how it's important to me. And you have three seconds, if you're lucky, to, for somebody to actually look at a box in a store with 100,000 products, and they don't even know the technology exists. So it's, uh, you know, it's, I always talk about it as puzzle pieces in terms of explaining and creating demand for products, whether it's a phone, whether it's a technology, whether it's a widget. Um, you have to put all the pieces together, and the package is that piece that tells your story when you're not there and the visuals and the branding and the marketing behind it. You know, all these things are, are minor little decisions that you make that all go together to create demand, to create interest, to create somebody say, who says, oh, I think I saw that. Oh, wow, that's cool, let me pick up the box. Well, then when you pick up the box, now what do you say to them? So there's all these levels of information that you have to communicate in a lot of different ways. Um, great products fail all the time, we know that. Great ideas fail all the time, we know that. Um, sometimes it's because you didn't communicate the message in the box. Sometimes it's because you didn't think about the user. Sometimes it's because you know you weren't able to get the message out there in a mass market kind of way. But you know that package and, and being able to tell that story is so critical, at least from the consumer experience. Um, that you know you, it's probably the the single most impactful thing you do, even though the technology is so amazing. Yes, absolutely. In terms and of the consumers, and it's even harder. If uh, uh, if you are in Mark's position in uh, at Merck uh, making uh, liquid crystal material that goes inside a, co a component uh, on the device, and uh, so uh, Mark, when when you think about these kind of things, uh, you look at the market. Uh, a few years ago, you couldn't buy a TV without 3D uh, capability. Today, it's the other way around. It's very hard to find them. Right, and it, went, it came and went very yes, quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How, how do you anticipate this? How, how, how does somebody in the audience that has the exact same problem as you, how do they anticipate that? Okay, I, I think the, the 3D TV at home was a, a really interesting example of this content and technology not quite beating at the right time in the right place. Um, if you ask people, you know, would you like to watch your TV in 3D, everyone will say yes. But people are fundamentally lazy. and. Uh, you know, if you have to do something really hard, like putting on a pair of glasses and sitting with a new pair of glasses on top of your existing ones, people give up very quickly. Like they say it goes in the drawer, yep. it stays in the drawer. Sure. Um, <clears throat> I think the, the, the key is to, to either have the fantastic content, which will then really drive people to put up with a little bit of hardship, where, you know, because there's so much wonderful 3D stuff out there to watch, and you, it doesn't feel the same without it, then they will put up with a hardship of this. Or, you do know, the other way around. You create such a good visual experience that actually the content it isn't the key point and people want to use it every day anyway. So um, I think this is a, a lesson for everyone involved in the industry that we really look at that 3D example and we say, you know, how do we avoid that next time with uh, augmented yeah. reality, virtual reality, and so on. And, and, and not to end up with a lot of people with their VR headset stuck yes. in the drawer, never being used. Let's try and make sure that we develop both the content and the technology to be really comfortable and, 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 and more than just exciting. It's got to be essential, as you say. And Sri, you look at this uh, display industry from the outside, yes. uh, in some sense. So what are the pain points that consumers are facing uh, in the marketplace from your perspective? Yeah, I think uh, to me there are three, three points, and uh, actually related to what Mark said, uh, the, the first is also a uh, cost, right? So major pain point is, is cost to the consumer. If I look at 3D, uh, one of the major issues was also the barrier to entry for a consumer. You got a 3D TV, which was like a couple of thousand bucks, and, and you know, to get one, then wear your glasses, it, it was difficult. Um, you know, if you look at VR, 
there is the Oculus, which is a thousand bucks, but there's also the mobile VR, which is fastly picking up like Daydream, which is like a hundred bucks. So the barrier to entry is low. So that's a key pain point the consumer is uh, is always focusing on. But then the second is um, seamless uh, quality of display, right? So you know uh, we are remodeling our house, and uh, uh, you know we are putting a skylight. Uh, we are I'm in the Bay Area, and I was just. Uh, a few days back, I was looking at the display. It's a solar-controlled uh, skylight, and that display—you won't believe it's—it's it's like uh, this uh, really old, uh, uh, you know, not a color display, but but it's uh, you know, it gives this uh, experience as though you you know, it's like 20 years back. And, and then I have my uh, you know iPhone next to it, and and it's it's not a seamless experience, especially with IoT. You're seeing so many displays at your home. And uh, like the Nest and all, you, you want this seamless experience, right? And uh, the third uh, major pain point to me is health issues, right? So, you know, you have this VR glass right in front of your eyes. I'm sure Mark from uh, Merck uh, can relate to this, but there's a lot of people who are concerned about their kids uh, wearing these displays right in front and, and what are the health issues. Uh, you know, with the phone, there's the, there's the issue of your neck. Uh, uh, you know, the concerns there, but what happens to the eyes and all that. So, to me, these are the three pain points that consumers are Absolutely. So, um, turning to somebody uh, that's been in the display industry for a long time uh, and understands these things, what is going to change and what innovation should we expect, Bahar? Well, um, first of all, uh, to, 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 to Shri's point, the experience needs to be seamless. And for the experience to be seamless, uh, displays have to get thinner and lighter and flexible and, and almost non-existent. They, they have to just be there without being there. So that's the one thing uh, uh, we'll, we'll certainly, uh, certainly see in the, in the innovation space. The other thing is higher PPIs. You need to have those higher PPIs. Uh, all of the phones, all the devices that we have, and I've tried out all the... Uh, uh, many of the devices from Virverna, uh, Meta, uh, the HoloLens, and, and after about four or five minutes, you know, to be on the trade show, you really want to sit down in a room and use it for half an hour, it hurts your eyes. It is very stressful. Um, and so the pixel densities really, really, really have to get very high. And there are other, other, other uh, elements uh, of how the brain processes the information that also have to be taken into account, which could uh, uh, bridge the gap between what's possible with technology today and, uh, uh, and, 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 and keeping costs in line so you're not building these expensive uh, uh, systems that maybe only the government can afford. Uh, so that's, that's definitely going to, to, to happen, um, I believe, in this space. Uh, for 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 VR to to come about. So when any time you do a panel like this, um, the moderator uh, had the opportunity to speak to all the panelists to understand their background and create some content so that um, you know they're not pausing and waiting to answer the question. Some of these questions have been thought out. Uh, and uh, since I came new into this, my style is uh, that uh, I always post questions that they are not prepared for. So I already threatened them this morning, but I'll give you a very short uh, notice. Um, I won't ask the question. I'll tell you what the question is going to be, and I'll ask that a little bit later. Is um, uh, you know, uh, this is an industry where we recognize a lot of technical contributions, not as much people that have had commercial contributions. So keep in mind, I'm going to ask you a question about who are some of the people that you can think of that have um, contributed in the broad technology industry that has inspired you personally. Okay, you don't have to answer it now. Um, and uh, well, I'll give you a little bit of warning. Um, so what is missing in the whole uh, film to display cycle? Uh, and any of you can take the question, whoever feels uh, um, uh, that you have a strong point to make in this space. Sure, I uh, can start. Uh, I mean, it's related to the question earlier you mentioned uh, about you know content versus display, right? Uh, and to me, uh, it's it's almost uh, decoupled uh, these days. The display industry versus the capture and uh, the content side, right? Uh, if you look at the uh, trends in computer vision, light field, and uh, uh, camera technologies, it's going at a really fast rate. Um, and then, uh, it's it's to me, it's not uh, it's not really linked with the um, innovation on the display side and. Uh, 
you know, when you look at like Technicolor, for example, we uh, work with the studios and uh, we ensure that the movies that you see in the theater is, is, is both, you know, good quality content being displayed well. Uh, but when you look at UGC content on your smartphones, and uh, I think there's still that uh, missing gap there between, uh, you know, guys like uh, Visionox creating the display, but, but then there's the content being mm -hmm. shot by, uh, uh, let's say, um, uh, Nokia, uh, Nokia Ozo camera, or, you know, it's, it's just not completely linked. That's, that's what I can do. The, the, oh, sorry. Go ahead. The, the, the other thing is also uh, the, the use of the content. So when you think about a movie, right, today we watch a movie from the director's perspective. You know, that's your movie. The director completely controls your experience. But once you change that and you create this augmented reality, and now you've created this infinite uh, uh, contextual reality, yeah. now you're in the movie, right? So awesome if you're watching a little bit of a demo. But what happens when you're actually watching a movie and you're looking around all over the place, yeah. and maybe you may leave the scene and go somewhere else? Well, what mm -hmm. happens then? And so, yes, you can say, well, well, there are virtual reality games that we play. So sure, but then it's not a movie, it's a game. And so now, where is the story? And do you create all these infinite stories? And how do you solve that problem? Uh, and there's opportunity. It's not just a problem. There's also an opportunity to create these, uh, 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 as you say, dynamic movies, for lack of a better, uh, better sense, that are somewhat curated, lightly curated. Uh, but this is the opportunity and the interesting uh, interest that, that could, uh, uh, that could uh, spin off. And to, to Shri's point, that has to be this continuity between uh, the, the content and the hardware. and. Sometimes we tend to forget the user because we get so carried away with our own technologies, patting ourselves on the back because we created this awesome stuff. But at the end of the day, it's the user we need to worry about. And, and that's what's important. Uh, I think if we start, as an industry, sp uh, spending more time understanding how users uh, experience our technology, I think we will accelerate some of the innovations uh, faster than simply uh, trying to make it cheaper or simply trying to, 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 to advertise ourselves out of it. And I, I don't mean to minimize any of those efforts, no, 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 no. But, but when users find things indispensable, it, it moves the industry forward. And I, I would also say I Please. think we have to consider the, these young generations now yes. who, for whom the content is a very different yes. um, concept. Yes. Yeah? So they don't always expect a director to prepare a nice film. Yes. They're more than happy to take their mobile device That's correct. and make their own content constantly. Yep. I, mean, I was at the airport the other day, and there was a little group of four or five youngsters, all under the age of 25, together, but each of them with their own mobile phones, taking little videos of themselves, yep. photographing themselves. And actually, you know, when we talk about content, I think to create devices and technology that enable next generations to create their own type of content is actually yeah. really important to give that experience. You look yeah. at the fastest growing trends in kids under the age of 15 and it's actually watching YouTube. They're no longer yeah. watching TV. They're no longer watching yeah. shows or programs and even you know the Netflix trends and things are starting to go away because kids want shorter, more interesting yeah. things that they control themselves, that they can share with their friends. It's, you know, it's that one to three minute clip that is just yeah. amazing that gets 10 million views. Well, now, how do you take all the stuff that, that you guys are working on and the content and the capabilities and put it in the hands of an eight-year-old and say, now you go do this. Now you create something that's three-dimensional. Now you create something that you walk into, that you show your friends your room in a three-dimensional way. Now you've just created something that, you know, a hundred million kids want. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it's so true. I mean, uh, when you talk about content, whether it's the experience that you had in the airport uh, and otherwise, uh, I belong to a news group uh, with uh, friends that went to engineering school with me, and uh, we talk about a number of different subjects. But uh, you know, when I go to events like this, I take pictures of all the different displays and different technologies and share all of this stuff. And to me, it's a big deal. And uh, when I share it on Facebook uh, or some other, like I get three clicks. Occasionally, one of those clicks is somebody that works for me. On the other hand, one time I wrote about. Uh, uh, a, uh, a chili a pepper uh, th that was quite spicy. And uh, I, I wrote about this, and I, uh, within an hour I had a hundred clicks, right? So it, it is, I think you, 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 the content has to be very personal, it has to relate to you. I, I think this trend is definitely going to continue. Yep. And um, so let's uh, go to that question that I had uh, previously threatened you with. 
um, in, in any order, um, tell me, um, uh, you know, um, uh, somebody in the industry, a broad industry, that has inspired you personally, um, uh, that has, uh, you know, you continue to seek inspiration, um, uh, that has, uh, you know, sort of been supported in, in your career. Well, how are you not shy, so we we'll start with you. <laughs> oh, I, I, it, it, it sounds, uh, well, it sounds comical, uh, maybe, but, uh, well, Steve Jobs, okay. Uh, for, for lots of reasons. Uh, um, but, but, but really two main reasons. One, he showed the general electronics industry to focus on the consumer. And, and I, I start my day focusing on my customers, and I, I uh, 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 that's important. That's where I start, that's where I think about if I'm solving problems. I, and then the second thing is, how do you actually make a business out of it? That's the other thing that's important. Solve a problem for the customer that's meaningful and make a business out of it. So that's what inspired me. That's what I'd like to. Who wants to go next? Oh, well, I, I, so I, I'll come at this from a little different angle as the new guy um, in the industry. I, I have to say, and I'm going to plug our team, I, our R&D team for me was eye-opening. You know, I, I was, um, uh, I've done a lot of R&D in terms of product development and, and new platforms, and I've launched technologies worth half a billion dollars that never existed before, and things like that. That's all wonderful, but coming to this industry and, and sitting and pulling back the curtain with our R&D team and seeing what these guys do and the capabilities, it challenges me to try and figure out how do I take these ideas and this amazing capability with our, with our group and be able to put it in the hands of consumers in a way that makes sense. And it, it really is amazing. I mean, every day walking through the labs, walking through the, the rooms where these guys are brainstorming, uh, it, it inspires me to go out there and go, we gotta get this in the hands of people. We have to take these capabilities because it's, people don't get to see that. People don't mm -hmm. understand all that goes into this you know, this little display thing that you can write on for us and say, oh, that should cost 50 cents out of China and, you know, it's no big deal and it's just a flat piece of plastic. But when you, you understand all the technologies that go into this, the consumer world, I don't think, really truly appreciates all that goes into these little things. Um, and it, for me, that's, that's, it, it's just really exciting to me because, it, it, again, it challenges me because you want to take these brilliant people's ideas and put them in the hands of consumers in a way that makes sense Absolutely. and just keep driving um, and bringing out new stuff because it's just fun. It's just that, that every day coming to this group, uh, that's why I'm so excited about yeah, it. I've had very similar situations where I've been inspired by r and many of the companies I work with. We're very fortunate today uh, in this audience we have uh, uh, the head of your company's R&D here. Uh, Dr. Khan, would you please uh, stand up and be recognized? <laughs> Thank you for inspiring your marketing head. Um, Mark. Yeah, actually, actually I, I don't want to bring one person because I'm rather right. like you, I think there's so many people that inspire me. But I, I will tell you a short story. I was working maybe more than 10 years ago um, in Asia, I won't even say which country, but I was working with a group of guys who were trying to break a breakthrough in display. They were the hardest working people I've ever met. They, they, you wouldn't know them by name. They were the guys in the white lab coats working in the back rooms. And they would work from 8 o'clock in the morning until midnight, and they would say, oh, Dr. Barrow, we must take you home to your hotel for the night. We, we will stay and finish the work after midnight. Fall asleep on the floor, literally, in front of the equipment to get a few hours sleep before getting up the next morning to try and solve the problems, bring the displays that you, we now take for granted. And when you go to the supermarket, you push your trolley along and you take some bread and some rice and some cornflakes and a 36-inch TV, and you just push it to the counter. We take it for granted. The, the work that has gone in to preparing and developing these displays is phenomenal. And I, I, would, I would take my hat off to every person Who's, who's contributed in that same way to do this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, uh, there's no single person. Uh, of course, there are the visionaries like Jobs or Musk, and, uh, you know, they're truly inspiring. But uh, 
you know, to me being in Silicon Valley and, and just seeing the last several years, um, especially the last five years or so, it's just incredible innovation and the people, startups, you know, coming with uh, new uh, trends, uh, combining AI and uh, computer vision, display technologies, it's just very fascinating to me and, uh, and there's a lot of hard work being put in to get, the, get, get those things to the consumer and, and yeah, I mean, it's just, um, it continues to, I was at Google I.O. last week and, uh, you know, the people there are just, just mind, -boggle, uh, mind boggling, right? I mean, you compare it to like 15, 20 years back uh, versus now what's happening is just constant new, new languages, new technologies. I, I mean, I heard of this language called Kotlin and everyone was like, big praise. Uh, I mean, not related to display, but, you know, it's, it's under the hood. Uh, this is fascinating to me, and, and I, I just feel that all of this coming together really pushes the boundaries, right? Oh, wonderful. And um, so, uh, uh, you know, coming back to our theme for today, um, uh, starting with you, Justin, what's next? <laughs> Should I ask uh, Dr. Khan? <laughs> <laughs> He's not wishing he hadn't shown up in the CMO forum. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's <laughs> I thought I was going to get out of that one. Um, you know, from our perspective, I think it's, um, you know, I've, I've sort of been the cheerleader for this idea of everyday, uh, everyday items and everyday things that change your everyday um, habits. Um, you know, for us, it's, um, it's obviously cheaper, thinner, but it's more importantly for us, it's more real. Um, we strive every day to try and recreate real experiences in the writing platforms and in the display feel. And, and when you can get, you know, something that somebody's done for 2,000 years, make it electronic, but make it feel like that 2,000-year-old that experience, you've now taken everything 10, layer, 10 levels up for the consumer user. And, and I think that that's something that we continue to push for is how do we create something that feels more natural, feels more mm -hmm. real. Um, the trends in the industry are amazing in terms of integrating technology into our world, but you also see a very, very big trend and consumers <clears throat> want to get back to touching and feeling and experiencing mm -hmm. and, and being able to, to get back to what they know mm -hmm. as much as everybody loves yeah. technology. Yeah. It all, there's also this, this concern, this fear we don't touch anything, we don't write anything, we don't shake hands anymore, we don't talk anymore. And I think all that stuff starts to come together to, to, to create a challenge for us in the industry. So. Mm -hmm. uh, well, for me, I, I, it's a personal one actually. It's not really driven by technology or content, it's driven by old age. Um, <laughs> what I would love is a really nice, simple, augmented reality where, for example, in this conference, when I come up and I meet you and I think, I know this person, it's Bob, Bill, Tim, <laughs> inside my glasses, a little thing says, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's Robert, you met him last week at the, at the dinner. Um, so, I mean, I think we would all have different uses for it, but a really nice, simple augmented reality, something which, which works, which is comfortable, which feels no worse than the glasses I wear now, but which gives me a little bit of extra advice and, and can remind me of things that I should have been doing or perhaps you know, reading my emails while I'm talking to you. So yes. uh, that's, that's, that's what I really want. Awesome. And we're not far off, actually. Yeah. If yeah. you look at what's possible now, the technology is there. It's mm -hmm. just a bit clumsy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have to refine it. We have to make that, that final step where you, you turn it into a really refined product and a refined usage experience. Yeah. And, and then, you know, in a few years' time, it'll be like your mobile phone. You can't believe you existed without it in the past. So, uh, you know, I'm involved in a number of different things, but specifically to the, the, the display industry uh, and, and with Visionox, uh, uh, the big thing, I shouldn't say the big thing, the thing that we're working on uh, constantly is to democratize OLEDs. It's, OLEDs are still a technology that's a little bit hard to get if you're not the, the, the big companies. And, and, and we see a different future. We see OLEDs solving the kinds of problems that cannot be solved with the, with the other display solutions that are out there. And we're getting closer and closer and closer. Um, and part of it is uh, the strategic commitment that we have uh, 
towards making display technologies that may be limited to only a handful of large customers available to people wanting one, available to people wanting 1,000, 10,000, really doesn't matter. So that's a, that's a business decision that was made by VisionOct, and, and we're very proud of that. So that's, 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 the, that's the, the, the one thing we're focused on, is uh, so that the more OLED displays are in the hands of the tinkerers, the engineers, the more input we can get on how they can be made better. Uh, the, the startups that can't afford to engage with maybe a Samsung or an LG because you don't have an order for a million dollars. Well, how do you get uh, these technologies uh, 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 exploited and uh, the experience around that to make it better and better and better? So that's kind of what we're focused on. Yeah, I'm, I'm with Mark uh, on the wearable computing yeah. side of things. You know, I. Um, uh, I want to see uh, always on wearable computers that's uh, with miniature lenses and, and holographs in, in front of you. Uh, I think uh, that's going to happen. It's, uh, it's something that, you know, I compare uh, movies that, that uh, there's several years back, you know, if you look, if you remember the things like Knight Rider, uh, <laughs> way, way back, you know, there's, there's a watch uh, that, was, that was there yeah, at yeah, that yeah. time, right? And then Jetsons, uh, right, with you have these uh, driverless vehicles, and and uh, of course um, there's like the Iron Man kind of thing where you have holographs and the uh, uh, variable computer. So I, I think those are going to happen, uh, especially with AI coming into the mix. Uh, it's just uh, you know we are in this precious time where we can actually see all that uh, coming coming to life. So. No, it's so true. Um, so uh, instead of waiting towards the very end, we have a few more minutes. Uh, I'm going to pause and see if there are any specific questions from the audience uh, to this panel before I go into closing uh, comments from the, the John. There is a Stephen. You can follow John. So, uh, Mark, I'm really glad you brought up the 3D uh, experience. I wanted to ask the panel to drill down a little bit more to that. <coughs> We had fabulous hardware. We had fabulous content. Every major motion picture came out in 3D. Uh, there were non-glasses 3Ds that if you sat at the right node, looked OK. But the passive matrix with 4K displays that looked great and were very light. And I get to your point about AR. A, you know, I want my whole car windshield to warn me about pedestrians that I'm about to plow into and all those things. But why is VR going to be different than 3D? Um, I, people are talking about there's no content yet, but we had content for 3D, and we had devices, and they were less clumsy to use, but I haven't heard why VR is not going to go down that path. So maybe you guys could drill into that a little bit more. I, mean, I, I personally think uh, it's, it's goes, it goes back to the cost, which I mentioned earlier, right? And barrier to entry is significantly important to the consumer. And you look at the companies that are investing in creating these mobile solutions. I mean, you get a smartphone today, uh, which pretty much everyone has. You buy a, a cardboard, um, uh, $50, it's, nowadays it's even free, uh, and you get a VR experience. I mean, think about 3D, right? You had to buy something much more expensive, mm -hmm. and you had to, uh, it's, it's not something that you would give your, uh, your kids and uh, I mean, you could, but it was much more expensive. To me, cost is key, critical, mm -hmm. and uh, you're going to see the Oculus kind of experience go to that $100 mark very soon. Uh, you know, Google just announced their all-in-one VR headset that's going to be much more affordable, and, uh, and then, of course, the content uh, plays into that hand-in-hand, -hand. but to me, that's, that's absolutely critical. Yeah, I think from a technology standpoint, and this is coming from the marketing guy who doesn't know the tech as well as you guys do by any means, but you know, I think the, from a cost standpoint, I agree. People are willing to buy something for $20 because it's cool or fun or interesting. And if I may not use it very much, but when my friends come over, it's cool to, to, to showcase when we're having a beer with, with our neighbors. All of a sudden, when it's $1,000, now what do I, why does it impact my life? Why do I want to use it? How, how am I going to use it more often than just as a toy? And I, I think that the cost is a really big factor in a lot of these things and just consumer behavior patterns as, as, as the cost comes down, the, the barrier to what am I going to use it for also come down. 
the other thing is also the usage model. So when you look at a 3D TV, it's content and individual use or multiple use, and you're right there and everybody's looking at the same thing. But once you start getting into virtual reality, um, you could be in the space with other friends. You can connect that. It's a very personal device, so the scalability is much higher, assuming the cost can come down. Now, the four of us could be wearing those and, and being in the same space, interacting in different ways. So now it creates for an experience that 3D can't give because it's, it's, it's very passive. One of the things that uh, the company I'm involved with, uh, we go scale volcanoes, believe it or not. Uh, and we capture the content in 3D, and we use those for educational purposes. And so now, you can scale down a volcano with us, by yourself, go all in place, not touch it, feel it. I mean, I guess you touch it, feel it, but you know that you know you're not going to feel it. But now this becomes an educational tool. Now, that's there's a place for that. Uh, think about how we grew up uh, uh, learning things in school. We go through a textbook, or maybe even on the internet, we'll look at things. But now, what if you could transport yourself in that space as a classroom to go and experience that, have an interactive uh, uh, model? Those are the kinds of things where, you know, purpose-driven AR, VR, beyond the classroom demo or the, the, the show floor demos, will we'll start uh, creating uh, uh, this, this. So that's, that's why, at least I believe, that uh, uh, virtual reality uh, will have a place because it has the potential of interactivity because humans like interactivity. And, and, and that's... Mark, do you have... Sorry, Mark. No, no, I, it's I didn't okay. Mean to, I, just I, question, I, but. No, I, I think the questions are very well answered. But there is a genuine risk of what you said that this yeah. will happen. You know, we really have to make sure that it doesn't happen by learning the lessons, making sure that devices really are comfortable and easy yeah. to use. They really feel you know, relaxed to use, and that the content's there to drive it. And um, otherwise, VR will do exactly the same thing. We will all have an old headset yourself. sat in a drawer yeah. that we never use. Yeah. Stephen, your question. Good morning, thanks. Um, when I heard some of the thoughts about the infinite context and the uh, uh, almost choose your own adventure style, uh, I really got my mind going. I'm thinking, well, okay, you make those e-readers, of course, very well. And I remember growing up, you know, we had these choose your own adventure stories. Well, this opens up the possibilities for, you know, turning on your e-reader and maybe some very good AI that somebody's developing somewhere is going to write all of these stories. Um, I thought that was very fascinating. Uh, I wonder if you guys had some comments about that, or maybe even on a separate topic. Uh, you were talking a lot about the augmented reality, virtual reality. How do you think that e-ink technology, electric rhetoric, reflective displays, can get into all of that? Stephen was my um, colleague. What's nice about SID is coming here, everybody's friends and family. I used to work for John Lamontjack. Uh, he will never publicly admit it, but <laughs> 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 uh, Stephen was part of my team when I was at EA. Uh, we made uh, uh, you know electronic paper displays that went uh, on the uh, popular uh, Amazon Kindle and many other devices. That's where that's the background. And that's where the question is. Um, any of you on the panel can take this question in terms of uh, you know their uh, their product is the how can. Um, is there some way the uh, augmented reality and some of the new technologies we're working on impact? Perhaps I can make a generalized question. I, I think the key is to find where the technology fits to bring some value into people's lives in a way that it doesn't normally. So it may be that you know, e-ink type technology just doesn't fit with virtual reality. But that's fine because there's the whole other 99.99% of the world where you can try and find the right niche, the right products that fit with people. And you know, I think the, the, the daylight readability, for example, the, is a huge benefit over liquid crystal and OLED displays. You know, so go for the outdoor applications, but you know, let, let's not all focus in on uh, these tiny headsets. Actually, as a liquid crystal guy, the amount of liquid crystal in the headset isn't very much. I, I like big TVs, so, so I, I would say from an perspective, do the same. Go for the big size stuff and uh, let, let the technologies create these tiny, tiny displays. And Thank you. Device. Next question, please. So, good morning, Philip. My name. Um, I have a two-part question I would like to ask. The um, first part is for the panel in general. So basically, um, I'm not so long in this business, only a couple of years. And my impression today is that 
there are so many things going on in parallel. Yeah, we have LCD, of course, uh, OLED coming, uh, QLED coming, uh, micro displays coming, so on and so forth. Has it always been like this, that everybody scatters in every direction, and um, it's a lot of discussion? And the second question now is um, to Mark directly. I'm also in the material business from DSF. Yeah? So how do you deal with that, all these counter-predicting <laughs> technology is going everywhere. I'll, I'll take your first question. Um, I love it. Um, I hope it continues to be like this. Um, it used to, uh, when I worked for a display company uh, as head of marketing, it used to drive me nuts that we have so many applications, so many things now. But that's how it is. Uh, and that's how it should be, because the only way you'll distinguish what is something really good is when you have something that you thought is really good but that didn't turn out to be really good and you learn from that experience. Right? Some of the previous questions also alluded to some of these same kinds of uh, situations. Um, other comments on the first question? Yeah, I mean, uh, so a lot of these technologies get developed to solve specific problems, right? And uh, you know, sometimes uh, assessing market need can, can, can get a little too uh, exciting and maybe a little too adventurous. And they're like, well, if we solve this problem, we can go sell it to everybody else in the world. Only to realize that you haven't quite realized why they're using a certain technology. So now you start to find homes for these technologies. And so then you have these all these issues. And in all of this, you end up with some of these core technologies that tend to solve a larger set of problems, which then take the lives of their own, and then they become the core, the, the, the central technology for a, a you know, particular era. Right, so I mean, we have the CRTs and then the LCDs and the TFT LCDs and the OLEDs and all of these things that are coming about, and, and who knows where we'll end up in the next ten years. Um, but uh, uh, but that's that's natural, right? Because um, I, I think uh, there aren't that many. At least I can't point to innovations where somebody goes, you know, we're going to invent this thing and it's going to solve everybody's problem. I mean, people think about it, but I haven't seen those kinds of things. They have this organic evolution to, wow, it seems to be solving a lot of different problems. So I don't think, uh, to Tree's point, uh, actually, I personally, I like that because it's, uh, uh, it gives uh, uh, opportunity for those, uh, uh, even the, the, uh, 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 the, the mainstream technologies to leverage from those innovations, and certainly for those innovative technologies to, to be scaled up because of the stuff. For example, OLED, AM OLEDs have, uh, uh, scaled up because of the uh, because of the, the 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 maturity of the TFT technology underneath it that allows us to have these wonderful AMOLED the displays. So uh, that that I think is is very natural. And in this industry, what you'll also observe is that um, technologies that you wrote off a few years ago mm -hmm. continue to exist. Somebody values it. Yeah. I've had the very good fortune of working on a TN LCD. ST and LCD before there was a single color uh, uh, liquid crystal display. I worked on EL displays. Um, I, I worked on uh, micro displays, all kinds of e-papers and so forth. Um, I assumed that the thin film uh, electroluminescent display would be gone long time ago. And it exists today. They still manufacture it today. Uh, in small quantities, they do. Uh, our main battle tank uses that display. There's not any other display that can replace it because of temperature range and so forth. So it's fascinating that some of these technologies to come on. Uh, do you want to take the second question? Yeah, yeah, okay. okay. I, think that, um, I think it always has been like that. I think we have very good selective memories as humans and we remember <laughs> the things that work and we forget the ones that don't. So, so that there are uncertainly a, a lot of dead projects that we choose to forget because they didn't happen, but they were there. Um, but your second part of the question, how do we manage this? Um, you, know, you can try and bet on every horse in the race. I mean, I gave a presentation on Monday from Merck for all our display materials, and we have many, many different display materials. So whether it's OLED materials, liquid crystals, backplane materials, we're working in these areas. I think the key to success is then to change the odds by what you do. So you can't bet on everything. You know, it'd be lovely to say, let's you know, make every material perfect, every technology perfect. You have to choose. And when you've chosen, you have to change the odds. You have to make this more realistic. You have to drive things forward in a way that really enables a product of the future. Um, if, if you don't do that quickly, you're left behind. Uh, I know a number of technologies that were better than the 
existing technologies when they were introduced. People were talking about you know, ferroelectric liquid crystals, far better than the thematic <laughs> ones that yes. we were all using. But they weren't in the market, they were behind. Unless you can catch up and overtake, you will get left behind because the rest of the industry moves forward very fast. So, mm -hmm. you know, OLED is right now in this cusp where it's starting to take you know, some percentage of the market share, um, some very high-end devices. I think OLED is established. But the next generation, you know, quantum displays, if you look at this, it's fantastic. A quantum display will be better than any display you ever saw. But can it catch up? Can it keep ahead of OLED and liquid crystal? And, and that's, the, that's the key to success. Yeah. You have to really drive what you're doing forward in a way that makes it successful as fast as possible. Get it in the market as fast as possible. That's so true, isn't it? Uh, we'll take one more question uh, from Asad, and after that, we'll go into closing. I, I think maybe a little bit related and kind of a follow on, but I'm actually curious if um, a lot of these channels, whether it's technical or marketing focused, all of us in the industry also tend to fall into this trap of we are going to predict what's next and what's not and what will work. I'm actually curious what, what the panel thinks, and, and I work with Justin closely, so, so we have a hard time too, as to whether it's actually very chaotic, and, and in physics, chaos is, is described by sensitivity to initial conditions. So, so yes, now we know that tablets and iPads are great, and, and you were saying indispensable tools, but the day before, it wasn't indispensable, and no one knew that it was. Um, VR today is not indispensable until the day it is. 3D TVs people thought would be indispensable and they didn't. So I'm curious what, how you guys deal with it in the industry in general and of course in your field and whether you agree or have a different look at, as to maybe we really cannot predict what will and what will not survive and here we become experts and come later and say, Oh yeah, that was really great. LCD won over plasma because of X Y Z, but but not a not a big one. So yeah. <laughs> so so, that's, so that's I kind of I'll, open thought about it. Like, it always goes in my head every time I'm in these in these panels, and, and we all want to do all of this, but at the end of the day, I'm not sure if we really can. No, it, it's a very good question, and. Um, this is a challenge that anybody in marketing always has, uh, which is, uh, you know, in some disciplines, you can say, my job is not to make a prediction. My job is not to forecast. But a true marketer has to forecast. Somebody's got to forecast. If you use the word forecasting right, uh, in the broad industry, people will relate that to weather, right? And I bet you, you go out there today and look at the top five TV stations in uh, this uh, local uh, LA area, and look at their forecast. And they've all spent lots and lots of money to build these fancy equipment and do this and employ people there. And you'll find that it is not uniform. And then you go outside, this is the reality, right? This is the challenge with you know, the stuff that is well studied and st still has a lot of unpredictability. Our industry is way more unpredictable than that. Yet you make the forecast. I, uh, in, a couple of years ago, um, I started looking at all the forecasts that I thought I had made uh, over my career in this industry, and uh, I was wrong at least 50% of the time. Uh, for example, I expected uh, OLEDs to completely take over from LCD 10 years ago. I didn't miss that by an inch by a mile, but you still have to make these forecasts. What I typically do is I look at whether I will use it or not, that's a test for me. Second, what are other similar devices even if it seems unrelated to a point, but maybe in different industry and so on, that have had success. You take all of these data points, and then you make a prediction, and that's how I do it. I'm sure uh, some of you may have a more scientific or a better way to do uh, this prediction. I, I can say, I said, if, if I could predict the future, I would be sitting on my private island now and not, uh, <laughs> not sitting here talking to you. But no offense. Um, I thought we flew you to <laughs> Yeah, yeah, maybe. <laughs> No, I mean, I, I think, um, back to my previous comment as well, you have to take some risk. You have to try and predict, but you can't guess. What you can do is try and change the future. You can try and create the opportunity for your predicted future to be the right one. And you can do that by really making the right products, having the right offering that customers want. And we all remember the entrepreneurs who are successful. 
that I think for every one of them, there's 99 who were equally entrepreneurial, were pushing their devices and work successful. And, you know, we, we should also give praise to those 99 who weren't so successful because they also create this push for the future. So grab what you've got, push it forward, and really you know, feel confident that you can achieve something in the market. And if everything goes in your favor, you'd be very lucky. Yeah, and I think we've talked a lot about it today, which is you know, uh, all of us have said uh, this ability to create something because we can is irrelevant if the other end of the spectrum, which is the true other end of the spectrum, should we? Yes. And, and I think that's what we, we, as an industry, have to look at what are the needs of the consumers. Yeah. And I think Bahari said, you know, you wake up every day and the first thing you think of is the consumer and the user. And that, that to me, is the... the, the the most important thing that we can do going forward because it, the intelligence and the capabilities in this industry are, uh, are mind-blowing. The, we could do millions of things, yeah. but if we're not tying it to a need and predicting what the user is going to, how they're going to react and what their needs are and how we integrate, all those things coming together. And that's why I say it's a puzzle piece because you have to build the bridge of those two things coming together. And those are the things you bet on. Yeah. Those are the things that you say, Here's why we're going to actually move this forward. Here's why we're going to advance this technology. Here's why we're going to take this concept, this idea, this capability, and go spend our time, resources, money, and energy versus something else because the user. And as long as we keep in mind the user and the, and the consumer and what's going to end up being the, the person that takes it and does something with it, you give yourself much better odds. You, know, you still are going to fail 70% of the time, yeah. but you're going to have a much better chance of, of, of being successful with whatever so you true. do. Absolutely. Well, uh, I'm going to go to my last question. And uh, um, what I'd like to ask uh, all of you is, uh, um, as we picked this panel, and I had the opportunity to look at each of your background and uh, uh, relate to your success, uh, I'm very inspired by each of you and what you, each of you have accomplished. Um, but uh, I believe that uh, success leaves clues. So um, I want to figure out what, what are those. I want you to help me find those clues. So I'd like for each of you to say a um, couple of habits that you follow even today and have followed most of your career that you believe is a significant contributor to your success outside of the degrees that you have and you know uh, the companies you work for and so on. Um, and we can start with you, Mark. Okay, I'll keep it very short. I think persistence is absolutely key. And don't listen to people who tell you they did this before and it isn't going to work. Yeah? Ignore them. Everything is different. Tomorrow is different to yesterday. Amen. The whole environment is different. Keep going. Keep pushing your ideas. Believe in That's it. That's awesome. Thank you. Sri? Yeah, you know, uh, to me, it's related to what Mark said. Uh, execution is, is key. I mean, vision is definitely very important but you know taking it to the finish line is if, if you don't take that to uh, execution you, you might have a lot of ideas and, and visions and initiatives but uh, if, if you can't really execute on it and relentless execution uh, doesn't mean anything how, how do you what does that discipline that you have that <laughs> causes you to uh, be successful? I mean, it could be any small thing it's 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 about uh, investing your time and effort and, and, and taking it to that. I mean, even personal life, you, you know, you, if you're going through this home renovation and it's just, you know, small, small things, uh, you, you got to, uh, you know, see through and, and invest your time and <laughs> otherwise you can, you can have a vision and you can have any, any kind of thought. Yeah, just as a, thank you. Justin, what habits do you have? What uh, what are things that you? Well, first of all, luck. If you, I, <laughs> for my career, it's been uh, I've been very lucky to be a part of really cool stuff and really cool companies, great people. Um, but I, I think the, um, the the never give up. When you have a vision of what you are doing, you have to believe in it. That's first and foremost. If um, if you don't believe in it, if you're not the cheerleader, if you're not the one saying this is where I want to go with this, nobody else will follow. Nobody else will do it. The second thing is. Um, uh, throughout my whole career, whether I've been in sales, whether I've been in marketing, whether I've been in um, product development, whatever it is, um, you know, look at things from the business perspective. You know, we, we so many times get we get so focused on what your discipline is. Um, I tr I've always throughout my career tried to look at things and say, how does this apply in the market? Okay, how are we going to sell it? Okay, what is the 
you know, how much resources are going to take from our R&D? Okay, well, what is the supply chain application? And I think it makes us better business people when, whether, regardless of what discipline we're in, whether it be technology, marketing, sales, operations, um, if we take the time to look across the entire business and say, how is it going to affect, even if it's not our core competency, ask the questions. It, it makes a better product. It makes a better um, program. It makes a stronger business overall. So. Mahara, what are a couple of habits that you've had uh, that you have today and you've had them before uh, that uh, you believe contributed to your success? Uh, the two, I suppose, uh, in specific, because over the years, those habits and practices have changed. But uh, persistence, and, and I, I will say that uh, persistence is important. But the but the but the one that I keep coming back to, uh, and it's hard to do, uh, but you have to make yourself uh, work at it, is really focusing on the other person's perspective. And I just don't mean the person, but the industry. Because if you can get good at understanding the other perspective, then you could get good at understanding yourself. And then you understand how good, where your strengths are, your weaknesses are. That helps you bring the team that you need around you. That helps you execute the strategies that you can be successful at. Uh, and then move forward. So that, that to me at least, has been my, uh, my habit and writing principles. I work very hard at it. Am I always successful? No. But I work very hard <laughs> at understanding the other, people, uh, other person's perspective. Thank, thank you so much. I think that is very insightful, so true. Thank you all. Uh, let's give a big hand to our panel. Thank you.